She wanted me to believe that she was Jeffrey's girlfriend, but I knew that she wasn't. But she wanted that to be the, the storyline. How did you know she wasn't his girlfriend? Because she's not 12. <laughs> <laughs> Christina, at the time, were there any red flags for you? At that point, were you thinking, children are at risk here? Unfortunately, I did not have even the wherewithal to think of such tremendous evil, frankly. I just thought she was the sort of rancid personality. I had no idea we were dealing with true evil. Why did you keep going back if you didn't want to go back? Because I was scared. I don't know what to do. I was afraid that he was going to harm my family. The same old story, over and over again. People who were close to Jeffrey Epstein. I had no idea. Really? Because you just said you knew that Ghislaine wasn't his girlfriend because she wasn't 12 years old. Kind of seems like you knew he liked girls. There's a big difference between saying she wasn't 16 and she wasn't 12. A 16-year-old girl can look like a 20-year-old girl. A 12-year-old girl cannot look like a 20-year-old woman. You understand? Christina Oxenberg clearly knew Jeffrey Epstein had a thing for kids, did nothing about it. By the way, she's cousin to the British royal family from the Serbian royal family. There are some key characters within Epstein's story that have not really been exposed and not really been called out. They've been interviewed by journalists and it's like the journalists aren't asking them the questions that they should be asking them and no one has really paid attention to people who kept Epstein's secrets secret. People are treating them as though they were silenced victims or somehow not an enabler which in my mind if you find out that someone's a rapist a a pedophile especially a pedophile and you tell no one and do nothing about it for fear of losing your job or the connections you have created or the reputation you have created then you're kind of an enabler and we now know that tons of hollywood celebrities have done this very thing look at harvey weinstein who happened to be buddies with epstein Look at how many people kept their mouths shut for fear of not being able to get a role in a movie. In my opinion, there is no situation in which you should be afraid to speak up against a guy pedophile. Nothing, nothing outweighs stopping a pedophile from harming children. There are three things that no one should ever keep silent. Murder, rape, and pedophilia. Especially pedophilia. The title to this video is not just a clever play on words. I mean it literally. As many of you already know, when I talk about a subject, I like to start at the beginning and then move forward in chronological order. And fortunately for us, in order for you to understand what I'm getting at and the angle I'm approaching this at, we need to start at the beginning anyway and it all starts with Epstein's first documented victim probably not his first victim but his first documented victim Annie Farmer and her sister as I recount this story I want you to keep this question in mind if the media we talk about fake news and the media is manipulating us and and it's true I mean just go over and watch Fox News like it, it happens right but let's say that a media magnet a mega corporation was successful in manipulating a mass audience they're successful in manipulating them would that audience know that they've been manipulated the answer is no if you've been manipulated then you believe them and you don't even realize what's happened now most of us would never want to admit that we'd been manipulated we like to think of ourselves as smart clever people who can discern fact from fiction so whenever I come across people who don't believe the media manipulate and don't believe the government lies. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. I think it's just a matter of ego. They don't want to admit to themselves that it's possible they've been manipulated. Keep that in mind as I recount this story. It all starts with a Vanity Fair piece on Jeffrey Epstein. Now, for those of you who are not fans of the magazine, what is Vanity Fair? It's an American publication. It comes out monthly. They concentrate on pop culture, TV, entertainment, celebrities, fashion. Their target audience 
is white women around the age of 40. That's the, the audience they go for. Now, what does Vanity Fair and American Spy Fox have in common? A lot of my audience is white males and females around the age of 40. So I have the feeling that a lot of you already know what Vanity Fair is. But for the youngins out there, in 1992, Vanity Fair tore Kurt Cobain's world apart. They labeled him and his wife junkies who were not capable of being parents and taking care of their own child. Writer Lynn Hirschberg stated that Cobain and his wife Courtney Love had been taking heroin and that Love was even using the drug while pregnant. Armed with nothing more than a Vanity Fair magazine, the Los Angeles Children's Services walk into the hospital room and take Kurt Cobain's baby away from him. Do you understand the amount of power and influence that this magazine has over government facilities? Kurt Cobain, a shy, quiet, harmless person who was thrilled to be a new father, was destroyed because of a Vanity Fair piece. Now, why is it that when Vanity Fair finds out that they're writing an article about a f pedophile who is hurting children, they back down? They not only back down, they keep it a secret for 13 years. In 2002, Vicki Ward, a very successful, very attractive, very powerful, well-connected investigative journalist is summoned to her editor's office. The editor of Vanity Fair magazine in 2002 was Graydon Carter. Graydon explains to Vicki that he has been hearing whispers on the New York streets about a financial consultant and investor that is living the high life, but no one really knows anything about. In the 1980s and the 1990s, Jeffrey Epstein hit it big out of the ballpark with billionaire clients who trusted him to manage their money and investments. He made a lot of people rich. He made himself rich. But there were also whispers of insider trading and manipulating the market. Graydon wanted to get to the bottom of Jeffrey Epstein's story. He wanted to investigate him, figure out who was this person who made it a point to stay stay out of the public's eye and to remain private who was so shy yet so rich and famous and knew all the right people. Graydon likened him to that of the great Mr. Gatsby. He seemed to know everybody. He was a New York socialite, well-connected, prominent figure within the world of politics, but no one really knew anything about him. So he put his top investigative journalist on the case. Vicki Ward was his smartest, most promising writer, and he tells Vicki, go interview this man, dig up as much as you can, let's write a piece about him. It was already rumored that Mr. Jeffrey Epstein was a bit of a womanizer who enjoyed the company of beautiful women. So who better for the job than Mrs. Vicki Ward? In 2002, Vicki Ward is tasked with writing an article about Jeffrey Epstein. During her investigation, she comes across a source who tells her that a woman she knows had a very bad experience with Jeffrey Epstein. And even worse, that woman's little sister also had a very unpleasant experience with Epstein. Vicky goes and interviews the two girls, the two sisters, Maria and Annie Farmer. Maria tells investigative journalist Vicky Ward how she came upon Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. She was a grad student at the New York Academy of Art and it is custom when the students graduate they do an art show and try to sell their art. Maria Farmer sells three pieces. She enters three pieces of art into this show and they sell immediately. The Dean of Students Eileen Guggenheim comes up to Maria and says, sorry that you sold that art to somebody else. You're actually going to sell it to these people. Those people were Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. Eileen Guggenheim, the Dean of Students, forces Maria Farmer to sell her art cheaper to Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell because they are huge contributors to the Academy and they basically because they have money and they're very charitable with it to this organization. Jeffrey Epstein tells Maria, don't worry, I'm going to make it up. 
up. This is 1995, the year that Maria graduates from the Art Academy, sells her art to Epstein. Just a couple months later, Epstein calls her. He says, I have a job for you. Jeffrey Epstein has acquired a mansion at the corner of Fifth Avenue and East 71st Street in New York City, and he wants her to be the art curator to run the door. There'll be people coming in and out of the mansion. You're going to run everything. You're going to do the design. You're going to be responsible for all of the decor in my mansion. So Maria thinks, great, this is a great opportunity. I just got a job for a billionaire. Soon after Maria starts her employment with Epstein, he casually brings it into conversation as though he's a friend, as though he actually cares about her. How's your family? How many brothers and sisters do you have? Are your parents still together? How are they doing? He tries to come off as a friend. He finds out that Maria has not one, but two younger sisters. One of the younger sisters, Annie Farmer, is 16 years old. She's a junior in high school and she has a lot of ambition. She wants to go to an Ivy League college. Mr. Epstein, who's a billionaire, and billionaires do this. If you don't know what a philanthropist is, it's basically a guy with too much money that starts giving money away because he doesn't know what to do with his money and he wants to help other people. Now, most philanthropists do it out of goodwill because they have a good heart. They want to contribute. They want to help people achieve things that they would otherwise not be able to achieve without the money. And then you got people like Epstein who use his money, pose as a philanthropist, but expect things in return. Most philanthropists do not expect anything in return. We all know what Epstein expected in return. He tells Maria, if your sister wants to get into an Ivy League college, she better do some sort of study abroad program. I'll pay for it. You're a great employee. I like you. I have tons of money. Let me pay for your little sister, Annie, to take a trip abroad. We move into 1996. Ghislaine Maxwell, who is just as much of a creep as Jeffrey Epstein is, if you don't know this, you're going to know this by the end of this video, talks to Maria and Annie Farmer's mother and makes her believe that Jeffrey is not just paying for Annie to take a trip abroad, he's paying for many different students to take a trip abroad, and that all the students are coming to his ranch, his isolated ranch in Stanley, New Mexico, that he has dubbed Zorro Ranch, this isolated place in the middle of the desert. All the students are going to gather there, Ghislaine's going to be there, who's a woman, and you know, we might as well face it, we trust our children around women more than we trust our children around men, right? And that's where Ghislaine comes in to his scheme. She uses her femininity to attract girls and keep their parents from becoming suspicious. When Annie arrives at the ranch, she realizes there are no other students there. She's the only one. It's just her, Ghislaine Maxwell, Jeffrey Epstein. They take her around Zorro Ranch, they show her the place, they, they try to impress her. Of course they work in, have you ever had a massage before? Ghislaine inappropriately massages Annie at 16 years old, pulls the sheet down to reveal her chest, rubs her chest, and the way the, this mansion, this ranch is designed is it's very open, so Annie can see that Epstein can see her laying naked on this massage table. But she thinks, you know, maybe rich people, maybe billionaires are quirky. Maybe they don't care about nudity. Maybe maybe this is just the way they are. The next morning, Jeffrey comes in her room, crawls into her bed, tells her he wants to cuddle with her, and does so. After a little while, she finally gets the courage to say she needs to use the restroom. She goes to the restroom. She barricades the door. Jeffrey leaves. She eventually goes on her trip. She never speaks of it. Soon after, her sister Maria is invited by Jeffrey to do an artist in residency. Jeffrey owns a mansion in New Albany, Ohio. Now, trust me, I've been to New Albany, Ohio. A lot of very, very rich people live in New Albany, Ohio. Leslie Wexner, owner of Victoria's Secrets, lives in New Albany, Ohio. Eminem at one point bought a home in New Albany, Ohio. A very sought after area, unless you're Dave Chappelle and you live on a farm in Ohio, you live in New Albany, Ohio. To speed this process up, because we all know what happens, not only does Jeffrey Epstein rape Maria Farmer while she's at his New Albany mansion, Ghislaine Maxwell rapes Maria Farmer. 
they do it together as a team. Ghislaine aids Jeffrey in having a threesome with Maria, only Maria's not a willing partner, you understand? Maria does the same thing. After gathering the courage, she barricades herself in the bathroom and waits for Jeffrey and Ghislaine to just casually leave. The next day, Epstein calls Maria, tries to play it off like she was a willing participant and says, oh, I had a lot of fun last night. How about you? To which Maria said, well, I didn't have any fun and I didn't like that. And then he proceeds to try to pay her off. Maria quits working for Epstein. She also calls her sister, remembering that her sister had went to the ranch in New Mexico with Ghislaine. And it turned out her sister said, yes, yeah, some, some things happened to me as well. This guy not only had the nerve to do what he did to her little sister, but then turned around and raped the older sister with Ghislaine Maxwell. That's how bold this guy is. Narcissistic this guy is. He doesn't give a shit about anybody's feelings but his own. He also stole pictures of Maria's 12-year-old sister she had taken of her partially nude because she was working on paintings about puberty and private moments. And understand that these were not sexually suggestive photographs. They were about a, a, a little girl discovering that her body is changing. It was art. It was meant for art. It wasn't meant to be sexually suggestive, but this freak took it that way and stole them. He literally raped and molested an entire generation of sisters in the same family. In 2002, when investigative journalist of Vanity Fair, Vicki Ward, is investigating Epstein, Maria and Annie Farmer recount what I just recounted to you to Vicki Ward. Not only do they recount the story, their mother also recounts the story. So that's three people that have told Vicki Ward about this horrible, horrible thing that Epstein did to an entire family of sisters. Now, as we all know, Vicki Ward's been on Steve Colbert. She's been on other YouTube channels. She's been on NBC, ABC, every outlet you can think of. And in 2015, she wrote an article about how she tried to expose the sleazy billionaire Jeffrey Epstein way back in 2003. You see, she was investigating him in 2002, but the actual article that came out in Vanity Fair did not was not published until 2003. When investigative journalists investigate people, it takes them months before the article is actually published. So she says in 2003, an article was published written by me. Vanity Fair decided to take out the parts about the two girls who were raped and molested by Epstein. And Vicki Ward and her editor at the time, the Vanity Fair editor, Graydon Carter, have justified not revealing this in their magazine by claiming they were receiving death threats. There was a bullet left on his doorstep. There was a severed cat's head in his garden. Yet my man Kurt Cobain did a hell of a job threatening the shit out of Vanity Fair just a few years previously. This is Kurt Cobain. I'd appreciate it if you called me at 883-1980. I have a lot of things to say to you. A lot of things to say to you. You parasitic little get anywhere they still ruined his life with an article none of this was reported to the police and the most powerful most famous journalist on earth did not document it and the only people that ever mentioned it years later were vicky ward and graydon carter graydon carter also says that it was their company policy that they have three character witnesses in case they get sued well, they did. They had Maria Farmer, Annie Farmer, and their mother, Janice Farmer, all of whom spoke on the record to Vicki Ward. Now, let me tell you the real reasons that Vicki Ward and Graydon Carter chose to betray the Farmer sisters and go on about their life. I'm gonna start with the really big bombshell. This comes from NPR, they're neutral. I like NPR, they don't really have a hidden agenda. They just tell it how it is. The next year, Ward, as in 
Vicky Ward posted an essay about Epstein and his circle. In that 2011 essay, she referred glancingly to Epstein's sexual peccadilloes. What does peccadilloes mean? It means a slight sin. And Ward wrote about Maxwell in glowing terms as, quote, always the most interesting, the most vivacious, the most unusual person in any room. I've spent hours talking to her about the third world at a bar until 2 a.m. She is as passionate as she is knowledgeable. She is curious. Vicki Ward tells us that years after she found out Ghislaine and Epstein gang raped Maria Farmer and molested a 15-year-old Annie Farmer. By the way, I want to make that correct. Direction. As you see here, she was not 16, she was 15. Vicki Ward and Graydon Carter have been on damage control for the past year, going on any show, saying that they were receiving death threats. They had a, uh, Graydon says there was a bullet left on his step, there was a severed cat head in his garden. Epstein was going to go to a witch doctor and put a curse on Vicky's unborn children. Let us not forget that Kurt Cobain himself called in a death threat to Vicky Clark and Lynn Hirschberg of Vanity Fair, and they didn't give two shits. It comes with the territory of journalism. They continue to publish that article. Perhaps, as Vicki Ward herself said on Netflix, I believe Epstein paid off Vanity Fair. Perhaps, if Kurt would have offered up a contribution, we would have never got that article, Strange Love. This woman has come off as, as a silenced victim. Years after she knew that these people were raping children, she was writing articles about them, she was hanging out with them, she was drinking with them. How do you go to a bar with somebody that you knew gang raped someone that you claim you once wrote an article about and you were going to expose them and just say, hey man, remember that time I wrote that article about you and you gang raped that girl and then you molested the 15 year old? Let's get another shot. You're such a vivacious, interesting person. Do people really care about prestige and money and connections that much that they can just forget about that? Yeah, I really gained the trust of those girls. They they really thought I was going to help them. I'm so happy to be here in this bar with you, drinking with you, being friends with you, writing great articles about you and your creepy gang rape partner. Oh, don't worry about them. They don't have a voice. No one will ever believe them. Well, guess what, Vicki Ward? People are listening to them. People do believe them. And I believe in time, your damage control and all this manipulation, bullshit that you're doing is going to come to light. NPR is onto it, other publications are going to be onto it, and soon you'll be exposed and everybody will know that you were literally friends with the same woman you claim you were going to expose. Ward concluded, in this city, money makes up for all sorts of blemishes. She calls gang rape a blemish. Let me leave you with this. In March 2014, a year before the sleazy billionaire article, a society photographer captured a snap of Maxwell as a guest at a black tie party held after the Academy Awards in Hollywood. The party was sponsored by Vanity Fair. It was hosted by Graydon Carter. Let me tell you something. These are invite only events. Okay? You can't just go to a party like that. You have to be invited. Well, what happened to Graydon Carter being threatened by Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein? What happened to him being terrified by these people? Listen to me when I tell you, Vicki Ward and Graydon Carter have done a great job of damage control and manipulating you into thinking that they had no power and they are the most, one of the most powerful magazines on this planet. That's why Jeffrey Epstein was so terrified that he gave them as much money as it took to shut them up. In the end, victims of sexual violence, I've never been one myself, but I've talked to them and I've heard their stories. And I can tell you that is very, very difficult for a person who's been sexually assaulted to recount that story. They really have to trust you. Vicki Ward gained those farmer sisters trust. They believed her when she said that she would do something about what happened to them. Vicki Ward and Graydon Carter could have prevented 13 years of child abuse. And instead they continued to write articles, posing these people to be great people of a great society. They took the money and ran. And then when shit hit the fan, they started saying, well, there was a bullet and a cat's head and, and a death threat and a, and a witch doctor. What kind of absurdity coming out of an educated woman's mouth? He threatened to go to a witch doctor and put a curse on my unborn children. It's bullshit.
They manipulated us. I felt sorry for Vicky Ward until I dug under the surface and found that she was an enabler. NPR is the only publication that has called her out for her bull****. When she does these interviews, she admits that Julie Brown is the one that actually exposed Epstein. She at least does that. She wants the credit. She wants you to think, uh, it was really me, but I just, I, I was helpless. How many number of smaller publications could she have leaked her information to? There are magazines in this world that'll print anything. That woman was not powerless. Graydon Carter was not powerless. They took money and they chose to conceal it. They kept his secrets, and I hope, and I'd almost bet you, because Annie Farmer and Maria Farmer have only spoken to NPR about this. On the record, if you watch the Netflix documentary, you never hear Vicky Ward talking about those girls again. You never hear those girls talking about Vicky Ward again. Why? I would bet you there's ongoing litigation. I would bet you Vanity Fair ends up paying a private sum out of court to the Farmer sisters. I would bet there's ongoing litigation right now. As Vicky Ward tells you, she was powerless. Those girls trusted that woman. Years after she knew that they had been molested and gang raped, she drank with the woman who did it. Hung out with her at a bar till 2 a.m., called her the most interesting, most vivacious person in the room. Go and look for yourself and decide whether you believe Vicky Ward and Graydon Carter or not. I can already tell you, they're full of shit.